I am here uh, at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. Uh, this is the first of a series of conversations that I am going to have uh, with Larry Diamond. So, Larry, let's begin. Uh, you were recently in Burma. In fact, you've been to Burma several times over the past uh, uh, couple of years as they've undergone this transition. Uh, it's a particularly crucial moment because uh, the National League for Democracy won a big parliamentary majority, and they're now uh, moving into the phase where they're actually going to have to govern Burma. And so I wondered if you could give us some impressions of how things are going there. Well, uh, thank you, Frank. Um, there's a sense of hope, but also worry in Burma that is now officially known as Myanmar, because the elections brought a tidal wave of political change to the country. The National League for Democracy, the NLD, won about 80% of the seats that were up for election in the two houses of parliament, with about 60% of the vote. But 25% of the seats in each of the houses of parliament, the upper house and the lower house, and in all of the regional parliaments, are reserved under the constitution for military officers. And those are only some of the many, many provisions that the military has put in place in the Constitution that give the military a safety net of, to use one of your favorite words, veto or uh, control, the ability to block democratic change and ensure military prerogatives. Uh, the military commander in chief has the right to appoint three ministers, the ministers of defense, home affairs and border affairs, those are very powerful ministries. And there's a provision in the Constitution that in essence enables the military to stage a quasi-constitutional military coup if they don't like what's going on. So the transition to democracy is not complete. There's been an elected civilian government. Aung San Suu Kyi is able to form a government but she's not even able to have the title of president because the constitution forbids anyone whose immediate family members have foreign citizenship, which her sons do, from being eligible to be president. And many people feel that was written precisely to prevent her from becoming president. There's also huge challenges of um, national uh, stability and consolidation because around the entire perimeter of Burma are a series of ethnic civil wars that have been going for more than 50 years. The military regime had negotiated ceasefires to several of these, but primarily the ones in the south. The uh, ethnic conflicts along the northern border with China still rage and many uh, people in Burma feel it'll still be several years optimistically before they can be settled. Now, one of the issues that I've been particularly concerned about in these transitions is the transition from opposing an authoritarian government to actually exercising power as a democratic government. So how do you feel this new democratically elected government is doing in terms of its ability to actually uh, govern Burma? It's too early to say. I mean, we do need to note we're sitting here in early April. The new government is only taking shape now. She's only recently appointed um, her ministers. And so we're still in a transitional phase. I think the positive side is that some people from civil society have moved into politics. They ran as candidates for the NLD and they've been elected to parliament. Including some of our former summer fellows, yes, uh, summer such fellows. as Zinmar Ong. And they're starting to take up their challenges with gusto and a great seriousness of purpose. Civil society is ready to work with the new government. I think there's a strong pragmatic streak. But another one of the concerns that you hear uh, on the street and in the circles of uh, both government and civil society, is that the new government and the National League for Democracy are both very hierarchically structured, uh, and they are very much extensions of Aung San Suu Kyi's 
uh, personal authority, her charisma, and her desire to be um, ultimately in control. So it has not been as interactive, it has not been as consultative, and has not been as successful at trust building between the new emerging democratic authority and the old partially exiting but still powerful military as the literature on democratic transitions tells us it will need to be if it's going to be ultimately successful. Well, I think we're all hoping that uh, they manage this transition because there have been a number of really difficult uh, transitions that have not done so well, like uh, that of Ukraine after 2004. So I think that's something we'll have to keep an eye on. It's certainly not inevitable. Um, the challenges are at least as great as in Ukraine or Tunisia today, to cite the other really challenging but potentially very hopeful transition. On the positive side, there's a lot of goodwill and democratic enthusiasm, some flexibility on the part of the outgoing military establishment if they can get a deal that protects their most vital interests. Um, but the circumstances are very sobering, and the fact that on top of the need for state building that you have written so much about, the need to establish new democratic institutions are two other very sobering challenges. One is we know from a recent public survey, a public opinion survey data, that the political culture of Burma is only very superficially attached to democracy. They're attached to the word and the idea, but when you drill down to the principles of liberal democracy, it's still a very illiberal political culture. And secondly, related to that, there's a lot of religious intolerance, there's a lot of ethnic complexity, and there are still huge challenges for creating an inclusive, multi-ethnic, and I think it will be necessary institutionally to be a federal political system.